Go, Brendan. And so, hi everyone. I'm Brendan Place. I'm an energy efficiency engineer at the at DOER. Um, my colleague Paul Ormond, who worked pretty heavily on this presentation, is sick today. So um, I'm going to be covering our portion. And we also have Ari Greenberg from BR Plus A. He's an engineer. Um, BR Plus A is a group that's kind of leading the way in building electrification and efficient electrification, and and you know has presented some really interesting new and and um, kind of emerging um, strategies to electrify really hard to heat buildings like lab office buildings and, and really high heat load and ventilation buildings, um, as well as, you know, other typical um, building electrification. Um, next slide. So during this presentation, we're going to just go over some of the real basics about heat pumps. We want to try to cover any, um, just make sure everyone understands how they work. Um, then we're going to talk more about the importance of heat pumps in and electrifying our, um, our buildings throughout the Commonwealth. And then Ari is going to go into some case studies um, that he's worked on uh, or that the group has worked on, as well as some strategies for retrofitting um, existing buildings. Next slide. So this is a, a Paul slide. Um, I don't know how he was going to deliver it, but uh, um, electrification is is just the process of you know swapping from gas fired systems. So it could be a, a space heater, a water heater, or even a cooking system to an electric system. Um, in the past, that might have meant electric resistance for water heating or electric resistance for for cooking. Um, we weren't typically seeing many people switch from fuels to electric resistance for heating. Um, but today, ele efficient electrification means swapping towards heat pumps for space and water heating and, and maybe an induction top for um, cooking. Next slide. So heat pumps, they all operate the same way. They take uh, energy from a source and then the heat pump moves the heat using, you know, some, some, uh, some physics, it's a vapor compression cycle. So it just takes heat from a source and then moves it to a destination. And, and that's how they work, which is you know a bit different than combustion fired systems, which are creating heat from a different source. Um, next slide. So we're gonna first focus on just what this like what the source means. Um, so next slide. There are Air source heat pumps. This means that um, air passes over the uh, condenser and it it takes heat from that air source and then it moves it into the where it's distributing it. Um, next slide. There's also ground source heat pumps. These are taking BTUs from the ground. So they just have a, a simple water loop. You know, a lot of times they'll have uh, an antifreeze in it to prevent any freezing. Um, it just runs a water loop into the ground that then passes over the heat pump to exchange the heat. Um, next slide. And so you can use heat pumps for heating or for cooling. So for um, so that air or ground are either a heat source, which would be for heating, or they're a heat sink, which would be for cooling. So taking BTUs from, from the building and then moving them into the air or the ground. Next slide. Um, this is, sorry. So this is just how an air source heat pump, which moves, heat pump works, which moves, um, and this is, would be in cooling. So it's moving air from the building to the, um, so hot heat from the building to the exterior, cooling the building. Next slide. And, and this would be the ground source scenario where, where you would be taking that heat from the inside of the building and moving it to the ground where it essentially acts as a storage device. Um, next slide. There's also um, this term for a water source heat pump, which predominantly gets its, its energy from a boiler. So it's essentially a, a gas boiler or a, a fossil fuel boiler that's attached to um, you know, a heat pump, which helps um, fine. It, it essentially, you know, the boiler provides the predominant source of heating, and then the um, heat pump just conditions it to the perfect temperature. 
Um, and th this is not an electrification approach. It, it relies heavily on um, on fossil fuels to to provide heating. And we just want to make that clear so that it's not confused because there's a lot of like air to water terminologies and and water sources is different than that. Next slide. So, so we've talked about the source, which is getting heat from the air. Now we're going to talk about some of the distribution strategies. Next slide. So there's really only two. There's air, air or water. And so you can distribute them throughout the, the building. They can both provide heating and cooling. Um, we think of, you know, when you think of a, a mini split head, that would be an air system. And that, that head can provide cooling and heating. Um, but there's also strategies with water whether in you know, radiators or chilled beams to provide heating and cooling. Um, and these strategies are used throughout you know, many different building um, types. Next slide. So when we talk about heat pumps and efficient electrification, we're talking about air to air or air to water or ground to air or ground to water. Um, we are tip like, and we wanna make that clear just so, um, so we don't consider water source heat pumps a, um, an elect efficient electrification strategy. Next slide. Um, we also wanted to highlight what a VRF system is, which is just a, another air to air or air, well, it's typically air or ground to water um, heat pump. And it, what's different about a VRF system, a variable refrigerant flow system, is that you can distribute different amounts of heating to each unit. And sometimes you can even do cooling. And when you're able to do cooling, um, to the different heat pump heads in each room, you could potentially share heating from, or you would be cooling, say, like a server room or a cafeteria, and you could be distributing that heat without, with heat recovery throughout other spaces, like an office space that might need heating at that time. Next slide. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the importance of efficient electrification. Uh, next slide. So what, what we focus on is comparing um, the emissions to deliver one unit of heat, so one MMBTU of heat into a space. And this is based on the year 2020. So next slide. So if you look at the emissions rates of oil, propane, and gas, um, you get, you know, emission rate. It takes about 170 um, pounds of emission to deliver one MMBTU of heat. Um, and the most efficient, you know, 95% condensing gas boiler uses about 120 pounds of emissions, um, GHG emissions to um, deliver one MMBTU of heat. Next slide. And when you compare that to electric, um, we see electric resistance is actually requires more um, pounds of CO2 um, to deliver one unit of heat. But today already, um, cold climate air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps are um, much more efficient and produce, you know, 50 to 65 percent less emissions. Next slide. And so as we, you know, this was already presented a bit earlier, but uh, Massachusetts grid continues to green um, and we're adding more renewables and reducing our emissions rate. Um, and this is a legislative requirement, so it is going to keep happening. And and we, there are plans to add new hydro and new wind, and we always have um, new solar being implemented. Next slide. And so if you look at the emissions rate, you can see it's declining down to 200 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, if you, today, actually, the uh, emissions rates are closer to um, 633 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, that's from a, a recent um, ISO New England report, um, but we currently have the 700 pounds per megawatt hour, which was a previous estimate. Um, and we have a estimate to be around 600 pounds per megawatt hour in 2030. Um, we anticipate we will likely um, be much less than that with the um, incoming hydro and wind, but that's a conservative estimate. And we are legislated to be at 200 pounds per megawatt hour by 2050. Next slide. And so when you look at the use of efficient electrification or ground source, you know, using air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, um, the emissions are, you know, staggeringly lower than what fossil fuels would be. Um, and fossil fuels will never get more efficient. They will always be at this emissions rate. Um, 
heat pumps can even go lower as the grid gets greener. Next slide. And so this is just for, for um, an example. So we're looking at a, um, you know, a building that would be built today using the most efficient gas and water, gas space and water heating. Um, and space and water heating only takes up a portion of the building's energy use. But by targeting that as electrification, we can see that in 2020 and 2050, that emissions rate stays the same. But in electrification, or if we were to electrify the building, we can reduce the um, the building's carbon footprint by you know over 60 percent in the in year 2050. Um, and, and next slide. So now we're going to review some case studies, and Ari is going to um, go over some of the stuff he's worked on. Thanks, Brendan. So um, we're going to go through a few case studies to highlight examples of both types of, of source and both types of destination. So that'll cover um, all different types of heat pumps. We're going to get to a, a new and exciting one, which is air to water heat pumps. Um, so we can learn a little bit about that, um, less so in terms of case studies, because it's an emerging technology, but more so in terms of a, 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 the potential for these types of systems to be a big piece of the solution for electrification. Um, in the state and in a lot of projects we're, um, we're working on it. Hopefully through this process, dispel um, some conceptions you might have about what heat pumps are um, based on, you know, having seen particular types of heat pumps a lot, um, but there are a lot of different types of heat pumps and they aren't necessarily obvious um, being heat pumps. So starting off on kind of a small scale, we'll talk about air to air. So this is a, a a variable refrigerant flow or VRF heat pump for the um, Walden Pond Visitor Center. This is a pretty simple approach and works very similar to the type of heat pump that you might see in your own home where you have a split system. So you have an outdoor unit that contains half of the heat pump and you have an indoor unit that contains the other half of the heat pump and you connect those two pieces of equipment with refrigerant piping. So the, the physical uh, process of the heat pump, the the physics, the vapor compression cycle that Brendan mentioned happens in that whole cycle. And all you're doing is, is just separating the components by distance. But in essence, you're taking heat from outside, pumping it into the building through the refrigerant. So on the inside of the building, you might or might not see um, the heads. It might be a concealed system that's ducted um, into the space, just like any other air conditioning system might. But you might see what you're most familiar with, which would be the wall mounted um, or ceiling mounted units that you're used to seeing um, in a home. So this is a small scale and we see air to air heat pumps being very cost effective and very efficient um, for buildings of this size. Um, as you can see uh, from this example, with a small enough building and, and when you really hone in on the energy consumption, you can get to net zero with, with uh, on-site photovoltaics in this approach. Next slide. So VRF, as I said, has the kind of, um, it is typically associated with smaller buildings, but actually is commonly um, or, or more and more so applied to larger buildings. So this is a project that we did um, for Boston Public Schools, the Boston Arts Academy, um, right kind of near uh, near Fenway Park over there in, in Boston. Um, and an example of really a, a whole scale application of VRF in the building. So if you go to the next slide, you can see, so this building is about 150,000 square feet. And we used VRF in this in this building to heat air, both at the air handling units and for zone heating and cooling. So a lot of people don't know that VRF, one of the uh, applications for VRF is actually to integrate it just like a cooling coil or a heating coil in an air conditioner. You can plop that into your air handler and make heating and cooling as if the air handler was just another zone in the building. Um, so this is a kind of a snapshot of the roof plan of that building. You can see those squares with the circles. Each of those represents the outdoor component of the unit. And you can see little lines coming off of them um, that are this very small diameter pipes that distribute to all the indoor components of the building. And as Brendan mentioned, this is, this is a situation where we took advantage of heat recovery. So you can have some units in the building that are cooling. And, and rather than reject their heat to the outside, they can actually divert heat to another zone in the building that requires heating. So recycling uh, heating and cooling rather than making it 
uh, from scratch is a big piece of the efficiency of these types of large systems. And the next slide is just a depiction of what it looks like inside the building. Forgive me for it looking very mechanical engineery, but you can see kind of little, little rectangles, which are the indoor components of the pieces, and then the other half of those lines connecting them to the outdoor components outside. Okay, so next slide is a project that you guys are probably familiar with at this point, because we uh, we like to do our song and dance about this, both at Bureau Posse and throughout the state, uh, which is um, the Spraga Science and Health Science uh, building at Bristol Community College. Um, so this is a ground source heat pump, and in this case, ground to water heat pump. So the building has a number of geothermal wells on site that circulate water throughout the ground and into a heat pump. And that heat pump creates hot water and chilled water for the building. So outside of the mechanical room, this building operates with some exceptions about other energy efficiency features, very similarly to how any other ordinary building would operate. We use the heat pump to create hot water and we can use that to heat air uh, in the building, heat the spaces, and we can make chilled water as well. So this very much so is a heat pump, but on if you're walking around this building, you would have not necessarily know that there's a heat pump running in this situation. So ground source heat pump is kind of commonly seen as the most efficient type of heat pump, but also sometimes a, a relatively expensive approach depending on on um, and how you set it up. So you're you're seeing other alternatives out there with air source that can sometimes be more cost effective uh, to construct at the outside of our project with the um, trade off of a slight downtick in efficiency, but overall a really good method to electrify. And then the next um, the next slide, please, is another project that we're we're quite proud of, which is the Chelsea Soldiers Home. Um, and this is another application of a ground source heat pump, but in this case, it's actually um, ground to air. So we're using a VRF system in this case, but normally when you have a VRF system, if it's outside, it's air source. We actually moved the VRF um, inside the building. You can see on the next slide. Um, these are uh, water source VRF units. So these, you can see the, the white uh, insulated pipes going into those, that's actually groundwater. So it's, it's coming directly from the geothermal system into the building. And then again, distributing with refrigerant um, to terminals inside the building, heating the air. Worth noting with this type of system, you can also plug in all sorts of other heat pumps. So in our case, we have ground source domestic hot water heaters that make all of the um, hot water for showers and sinks in this building, running off the same principle. We pull heat out of the ground uh, and we move it into the destination, in this case, hot water. So um, the next, the next kind of little lesson here, this is about air to water heat pumps. So this is a, a new technology, newer technology that we're pretty excited about um, at applying on, on a lot of our projects these days. An air to water heat pump is very analogous to a boiler and a chiller. So the same way a boiler could make hot water for a building and a chiller can make chilled water, this is the same idea. Uh, but rather than combusting a fuel to make hot water, the heat pump is going to pull air from outside, uh, pull heat from, from ambient air, and distribute it into the building. So as I mentioned, these, are, these, these can be more cost effective, especially at buildings of medium and larger scale, um, and are capable of, in most buildings, supplying 100% of the heating and cooling for that building. When we start looking at really large um, or really energy intense buildings, for example, lab buildings, sometimes we're using approaches where the heat pumps are providing say 90% of the heating, just because when it's extremely cold outside, uh, we need a little bit more capacity that's, that's difficult to get without um, impacting the electrical service of the building. But by and large, these types of heat pumps can provide the majority of the BTUs we need to heat and cool um, energy efficient buildings. So in a new construction project, if you're considering air to water heat pumps in a new building, we often move to the most 
energy efficient type of system, which is which is one in which we decouple ventilation requirements in the building from heating and cooling. So if you're familiar with the term a DOAS, direct out, or dedicated out, outside air system, uh, but there's also applications to retrofit air to water heat pumps into any building that used to have a boiler um, that needs hot water. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. The next slide. So kind of a good, better, best of applying air to water heat pumps. Um, good is like this kind of assumes anywhere where there's a boiler, replace it with an air to water heat pump. So we distribute hot water in a building uh, to the various coils that it needs. In some buildings, we don't have chilled water, right? We're doing cooling with other means with, with DX and that's not necessarily a problem. Heat pumps are more than happy to just do the hot water and, and let another, another piece of already electrified equipment make, chill, make the, the cooling for the building. Um, in the better situation, we have a building that has chilled water and it's, it's almost always more efficient to move heat around the building with water than with air. So that's why we prefer um, using chilled water when we can for cooling and, and the heat pumps can do that as well. So moving, um, making hot water to those components that need it and chilled water that needs it as well. And then, as I mentioned, the absolute best application um, is a decoupled system where we make air um, for the whole building for ventilation and then do heating and cooling separately. Um, I see a question about the temperatures that air to water heat pumps can make. Um, and that's a great question that we're gonna answer in two slides. So next slide, please. Um, just a, a couple kind of pictures. What are we looking at? What do these things look like? We've got um, kind of two main ways to do this, a packaged approach and a modular approach. Think of a modular air to water heat pump that's you know little individual units that you can just stack up next to each other to make one big piece of equipment um, for the capacity you need. These um, systems come in two pipe, meaning they make hot water or chilled water at any given time, but also four pipes. So these are machines that'll make hot water and chilled water simultaneously. Um, and in fact, when there's loads that exist at the same time, they will do heat recovery just like VRF does. So they'll swap hot water and chilled water loads internal to the machine. Next slide. This is where we talk about the uh, temperatures that these heat pumps can make. So this is a, a, an example of the relationship between the efficiency and also capacity of a heat pump at various outside air temperatures. Most manufacturers, I'll say the, the, the image on this slide is actually an anomaly for a particular manufacturer that's using a special type of compressor to get very hot uh, supply temperatures. But by and large, most manufacturers are are stopping at about 130 or at most 140 degrees supply water temperature. Um, and that's important because that's nominally a little bit cooler than a lot of uh, legacy buildings are designed for typically on the order of 180 degree hot water. So there's some considerations when we're talking about retrofitting buildings for, for the temperature of the water that these can actually make. And that can sometimes result in a few other changes that you would need to do to get the, um, to get these heat pumps to work. So the manufacturer shown on screen is, is called TSI. Um, they're the, the, like I said, the graph on screen is, is for informational purposes. They're not a manufacturer that we've uh, actually have experience installing in the field, but we wanted to illustrate the relationship here about how when you ask for hotter temperatures, your COP, your efficiency decreases. Um, and also when it's colder outside, your COP also decreases. So your, your heat pump does have to work a little bit harder when it's say zero uh, or below outside, but still very much so uh, makes hot water. And as you can tell on the order of two to three times more efficient than running um, a combustion based system. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, in most cases, um, heat pump buildings don't need any sort of combustion based backup they as as you can tell their uh, cop might decrease for those hours but as but for any normal temperature um, that we experience in our climate these types of heat pumps uh, can work and will produce reliable heating in the building at a higher efficiency than gas the one exception to that rule is any time when we have redundancy requirements um, for two, two separate fuels in the building. So that applies, for example, in healthcare, 
um, and and would be standard if you had you know a, a a gas or a diesel generator for the same reason that we need a, a way to heat the building if the power goes down. But that's really not a normal operating uh, condition at all and not uh, applicable to most types of buildings. Next slide. So a, a little kind of note on making heat pumps work really in any, any building. Heat pumps uh, like to work at kind of a constant state and don't like buildings that where they're where they're constantly working really, really hard. So the first step in, in applying heat pumps to any building is making an energy efficient building in its own right um, by working on load reduction. Um, and then for air to water heat pumps in particular, we wanna refocus the systems to use lower temperature hot waters in the range of, you know, lower is always better. We've, we're doing some buildings with a hundred degree hot water, for example, but, but really you know, noticeably a little lower than uh, boiler based systems. We in step four, we look at opportunities to recycle heat in the building, right? A heat recovery chiller takes somewhere that needs cooling and somewhere that needs heating and matches them up so that they don't need to create any new energy. And then finally, at the end, we electrify by applying a heat pump. So kind of an interesting list to think about if you're thinking about retrofits as well in a building of how you can prioritize um, efforts, but also kind of projects to get towards electrification. The next step. So some pros and cons of air to water heat pumps. Um, pros, especially compared to geothermal, is cost um, associated with not having to drill any wells to get heat out of the ground. So air-based systems here um, are especially uh, desirable, but with the familiarity of having uh, hot water and chilled water you know, distributed in the building compared to refrigerant, like it would be for a VRF system. Um, and really that leads to a lot of flexibility and scalability um, and potential for retrofits in a lot of buildings. It's worth mentioning the air to water heat pumps um, do fall under both utility incentive programs and um, the alternative energy credit program. Um, so you can actually kind of, um, our, our projects are seeing some financial benefit from installing these types of systems. Uh, just a couple of cons, we noted the hot water temperature issue. We'll talk a little bit more even about that. Um, and sometimes the concern with noise that these pieces of equipment live outside and they have a fan and a compressor in them that we have to sometimes mitigate if we've got neighbors um, close by, take up a little bit of space either on the roof or outside on site. Next slide, please. So that kind of introduces um, air to water heat pumps um, as a uh, the kind of the last the last piece of that square um, of ground source air source and two water and two air. Um, when we start thinking about retrofit considerations, next slide. As I mentioned, the first step is to think about load reduction. So because heat pumps operate with lower temperature fluids um, and because they prefer to operate or they're most efficient in operating at a steady state, um, we find that when you have a building with a poor envelope, um, a leaky building in particular, that you get a, end up with a lot of complaints uh, with heat pumps that they can't keep a space comfortable. It's not really inherent to a, a fault of a heat pump, but more, um, more really an issue that uh, fossil fuel based systems are just typically sized such that they can compensate uh, for those shortcomings. So something to think about when you're applying heat pumps that often goes well to think about ways to reduce air leakage um, and improve the envelope of a building at the same time. Next slide. And then we think about compatibility when we're thinking about retrofits. So this is really a, a um, this is a situation where we think about, okay, for a, a particular building that we're working on, how do we pick the right type of heat pump to drive with what is already going on in the building uh, without creating too much disruption? So um, also with the, with the hot water temperature issues, sometimes we need to look, and this is really a design exercise to look around the building and figure out, are there particular coils we need to replace to work with lower temperature hot waters? Is there one piece of equipment that's, um, that's suffering from lower temperature hot water and figure out, you know, is it best to replace those components? Maybe, uh, you know, this is a situation where a water to water, uh, uh, two water heat pump um, 
is not as good as VRF because of the kind of retrofit um, compatibility, but also we will show you in a couple of slides an application where we can um, figure out some hot water just for a couple of uses that need it at that temperature without impacting the whole building. The next slide. So as I mentioned, um, this is really an exercise in coil selection. Um, if, you've, if you've ever poked your head in a mechanical room or above a ceiling, there a, a lot of buildings are filled with these coils that are you know, hot water running through these and air passing over to heat a building. Um, the temperature of the fluid running through it has everything to do with how much heat that they can output. So that's a careful consideration. And then the, the piece of equipment on the right is representation of a water to water booster heat pump. So this is an applicant, this is actually used CO2 uh, as a refrigerant, which is slowly making its way over the, um, over the ocean to North America as an application. But CO2 is able to produce much hotter um, temperatures. So this is a way that you could actually boost, for example, um, uh, the main source of hot water in a building that's at a you know 120 degree temperature, for example, up to 180 or more that you would need um, for certain pieces of equipment. So just because there's one you know certain application where you need hotter water, it doesn't preclude uh, heat pumps from being a viable solution in the building. And that's that's really worthwhile to remember that we we have solutions for hot water. Uh, with heat pumps. We cannot make steam with the heat pump. That's probably the, the one limitation, but when we need hotter water, we can do it. Next slide. So as you can kind of tell, one of the benefits of, of VRF with the very small diameter piping and the a lot of different types of terminal units that you can retrofit even to uh, historic buildings in electrification solution. So um, you can also kind of add VRF into a building without having to integrate it into what's already there. So this is an example of a building in, um, in Milwaukee that used uh, you know, a VRF system and you really can't even, can't even see. Next slide, please. So when you kind of blow this up beyond the building scale, we start to think about uh, district system. So the same way you can make hot water and chilled water uh, for a building, um, you can make hot water and chill, chilled water for a whole campus, um, but you can also distribute the boreholes, the, the groundwater, the, the heat pump, heat exchanger all throughout a campus. And this is a kind of a, a preeminent or a premier system. One of the first entities to do that was, was Ball State. Um, that created a district of geothermal boreholes in buildings running off of them. Um, and they did it with a, I believe they actually did it in a phased approach to get the whole campus running off of this. Um, this last, this last example of a campus approach I'll breeze through because I admittedly don't know a ton about this one, um, but this is an application at Stanford um, out in California that did a district heat pump system um, to help transition their campus off of steam. It's a pretty extensive uh, retrofit for their campus. Um, they also do a lot of heat recovery uh, at their plant to cycle simultaneous heating and cooling around campus. Um, but there was a pretty significant um, kind of infrastructure uh, plan in place to transition them to, um, to lower temperature hot water. It's worth noting um, there, are, there are a lot of um, educational entities in particular that are doing this same type of thing. So Amherst College is, in, is you know, unveiled some plans to um, to do some district ground source as well and a number of other universities. So certainly precedent for, um, for colleges in the state to, uh, to embark on that endeavor as well. I'll do, I have one more slide and then I'm gonna pop open the chat and try to answer some of those questions as well. So not to forget about um, on that last slide, service water heating, so domestic hot water, we can do heat pumps as well. You're probably familiar with, or you might be familiar with, um, with heat pump water heaters for homes. This is something that you've, you know, might've even seen on the shelf at Home Depot lately that just replaces a, a water heater in a home, but the, those types of equipment scale as well um, to commercial applications where we need more hot water. And in fact, 
the kind of newest or latest and greatest technology that we're about to see happen is CO2 based hot water heaters that are actually able to to make significant amounts of of pretty hot water um, because of the properties of CO2 as a refrigerant. Um, so that's something that we'll, we'll look out for and kind of the it's the it's the the last frontier, I would say, of heat pump applications to be able to finally do domestic hot water in a large enough quantity that it can be used in facilities that actually need a lot of hot water. So residential applications, healthcare applications where we need um, to heat enough water. So I'm going to try to answer a few questions that popped up in the chat real quickly. Um, so so Eric's question is, um, can you do air to water heat pumps in a, um, in a district system? The answer, as you can see, is yes. We're seeing also often there's times when you can actually integrate a ground source and air source system together. Um, so there's no reason not to combine types of heat pumps if you're making hot water with air and sometimes of the year and making hot water with, with ground source sometimes of the year. Um, so, uh, question about wastewater pump stations. Um, I think it's a, a, a bigger question just about large open spaces yep. that might have some, you know, varying loads. But yeah, so we've I, I've thought about this question um, more so in the context. Some, I was asked recently about. Um, you know, op large open bay spaces, maintenance facilities, for example, but the question is probably a similar answer. Um, in, in, you know, my, as a designer, I would, I would tend to say that radiant systems um, for comfort are the way to go in that situation where we prioritize um, radiant energy because it makes people comfortable without necessarily heating an entire space. Um, and that can be challenging in some ways with, with retrofits, but, but, any heat pump that makes warm water that can be circulated, for example, in a slab um, or in, in panels throughout the space can help out. But it is, it's definitely a tricky, you know, a tough nut to crack when there's, when we have a leaky building uh, and we're trying to, to do thermal comfort, because the last thing we want to do is, is heat the outside world with the heat pump. That'll, that'll very quickly flip the, the equation on its head. And I, I just to add to that, I've, I've reached out to several manufacturers to see if they had, you know, one-to-one -one packaged rooftop units that you could substitute. And they, there are several like lines that are available, um, but I wasn't able to find any case studies where they were actually installed. So, I mean, I think it'd be hopeful to see something like that installed on maybe a, a better insulated um, warehouse that has less bay doors on it, something that, that, um, but but it I don't know of any that that it's been installed on yet. Right, and the the VRF coil solution is potentially an application for that, albeit probably not as cost effective as as packaged uh, systems that mm -hmm. that we're used to seeing. Um, there's a question of do we know any projects that use underground water distribution lines instead of wells for heat pumps? I don't know of projects of that nature, but I do know of a pretty innovative technology that's coming on the market now, uh, which is a wastewater heat pump. So actually a, a heat pump that's able to draw um, heating out of all the water we throw out of a building from showers and other uses um, and actually, you know, pull the heat out of that before it goes down um, into sewer. So certainly anywhere where there's, um, anywhere where there's a source of, of thermal energy that we're getting rid of and we're daring enough to put a, a coil down into it, we can extract heat with a heat pump. And, and just while we're on the district system, I, I just wanted to add a few notes. Um, so on top of Ball State, which is really a, a model, um, there's a few other colleges that have done this or are planning on doing something similar. So another example is um, Weber College in, uh, I think it's Nevada. And then Smith College is, has a plan to do this. Um, but one thing I wanted to highlight about the Ball State project is that if, so what they found is they, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but, you know, say they installed 200 wells originally without any, um, you know, if you were to have installed wells to service each building, it was something like, you know, 500. And um, 
and when they interconnected them, they were able to, you know, recycle heat and cooling between buildings. So it acted like a big heat recovery system and you were able to reduce the size of um, the geothermal well um, pretty significantly, which I think is really um, interesting. Um, yeah. Another, another nice way of thinking about the way they did that system is that, um, you know, if, if at the beginning 500 wells uh, could have covered half the campus in at the same time that you do uh, the ground source retrofits, the buildings can also get more efficient and then you end up in a final, a final scenario where uh, you know, the same number of wells can actually cover the whole campus, for example. So that's why electrification is always kind of going in, in lockstep with making buildings more efficient um, so that the, the heat pump heat pumps themselves can can do more as a proportion. 